Hello, my name is Deborah Gonzalez and I'm your instructor for Social Media and the Law. Today's session is about digital asset management and digital legacy, both for our business clients as well as for individual personal clients. Now, as always, we begin with our disclaimer that this session is offered as educational purposes only and should not be construed as legal advice. Every case is different, every client is different, and these do deal with issues with wills and estate planning. So you wanna make sure if this is not your area of practice that you can speak with an attorney or reference your client to an attorney that deals with that area. So today we're going to be looking at again a brief definition of what is social media to make sure that we're all on the same page. Some issues with digital asset management, types of digital assets both in the business world as well as for our individual personal clients, how to create a digital legacy plan, and then we'll end up with some last minute best practices that we can put into place. So let's begin with just a brief definition of what is social media to make sure that we are on the same page. And for us, we're looking at social media as different online platforms that allow us to communicate with our community and our clients and others in the legal profession, as well as to disseminate information to those individuals and get information back. So when we look at this issue of digital assets, I want to present to you and share with you some examples and some scenarios of, so that you can see how these actually play out with some legal cases with our clients. So the first one is a young woman whose name is Peggy. Now Peggy was diagnosed with cancer and Peggy took to blogging, which is a long form way of writing out, you know, her thoughts and her feelings and describing what it was that she was going through during her battle with cancer. Now at a certain point, she got so sick that she really couldn't continue the blog, but her brother picked up and by interviewing her and what she told her brother, he would then put it into the blog to continue it. Now when Peggy died in this scenario, her family continued to blog and the blog became a venue for her friends and family to talk about what they felt about Peggy's ordeal and about Peggy herself. Now in a different scenario, we had a husband who had a heart attack in his office and he died. His spouse did not know that he actually had some stock options. And the reason why she did not know this was because all communication regarding the stock options actually came to his personal online email account, which she had no access of and didn't even know that he had when she finally discovered through the, the um, will process and his executor finally discovered that he had this account and that these stock options were there, it was already too late. And that turned into a $19,000 loss just because they didn't know the email. On another scenario, we have another blogger, Leslie Har Harpold. Now what's interesting about Leslie is that he really put out a lot of online content and he created this amazing online community of friends and even just admirers, people who enjoyed his writing, enjoyed what he wrote about. Unfortunately, when he died, his family decided to permanently delete all of his content from the internet. And so it became a real loss to that community that he had formed. In another case, we have one about a U.S. Marine, Justin Ellsworth, and you might have heard about him in the news because this is one of the few cases that actually went to court. He was stationed in Iraq in 2004, and what he did was he created a communication stream through email and his Yahoo account with his father, and they would pass back and forth different photos, different comments, um, even different jokes. He was killed in 2004 during a roadside IED in November of 2004. And although Justin's father had his communication um, from his side to Justin, he also wanted to get Justin's communication. Now, when they asked it of Yahoo, Yahoo 
turned to their terms of service, which very specifically stated that the accounts were non-transferable. In other words, that the father could not put his name to the account to gain access. Justin's father and family then took Yahoo to court, requesting that the court order Yahoo to give over um, access to those emails. What Yahoo did after about six months in this uh, trial scenario is they sent to Justin's family CDs and boxes of printouts of Justin's email correspondence. They did not give access to the account, but they did send the contents of that account. But it is one of those few cases that actually went all the way to court to get access to the content there. Okay, and the last scenario that I want to put out is for our business clients. We have a very successful, small family-owned business. The father, who sort of ran the business, um, becomes incapacitated. But he was the only one who knew where anything was in regards to the account. So passwords, um, what company he had the accounts with, and because of that and because his son, who was taking over the company, could not get any access to it. The business actually failed. Okay, So all of these cases just really put us on alert as to what can happen when access to data that we've stored online, that we think that we're steering in a very um, safe environment, all of a sudden becomes inaccessible to those who need it to continue and be viable with the content that those assets have. So hopefully as we go forward in this session, we're gonna see it. what are some of the things that we can do and work with our clients so that these scenarios do not happen to them, okay? And the first thing is let's take a look at, you know, we're calling it digital assets management, but there are many names for what these things are online. They may be called digital artifacts or the digital footprint of an individual. Sometimes you may hear it being referred to, especially with businesses, that it is their digital presence online. Then there are the aspects of digital property, things like intellectual property, logos and trademarks and other copyright that may be online and beyond. They could be called digital possessions, okay? Or on a negative connotation, they may be called digital dirt or clutter or litter or in the most basic way of referring to them, they might just be called our online stuff. Okay, so whatever it is that we're going to call it, um, they basically, you know, contain things like Facebook status updates and contents that may be on a Facebook page, the tweets from Twitter that may be posted, a blog post and articles that individuals may put up. It might have to deal with online subscriptions that people have. So if you think of, you know, there are so many individuals now with tablets and they might get subscriptions to magazines or even newspapers on their tablets, okay? And online photo and video collections. So these are just some of the kinds that are out there. You know, some very interesting facts is that they estimate that individuals in developed countries, countries like the US, the UK, um, France, Germany, even China, each individual will create approximately 88 gigabytes of data in their lifetime. 88 gigabytes. What does, do those 88 gigabytes contain and what happens to them when that individual is no longer around. We know that through a recent survey with the ABA that less than 35% of Americans actually have a will, trust, or power of attorney to even dispose of tangible items, things like if they have a painting or if they have a house or if they have a CD collection or a stamp collection. So less than 35% of Americans even have that document and less than 1% of Americans have even thought about what may happen to anything that's not tangible, anything that's digital or online that they're not seeing and touching, like the things that we're talking about today. 
Now, when it comes to businesses, businesses also create tons of digital data from internal sources like internal reports and audits that they may be doing to end user content that's generated and gathered from their online social media forum sites. Okay. And the question becomes, well, who has access to this data? Where is it stored in the company? And who knows the account IDs and passwords? And this becomes even more important with regulated industries like the financial industries and the insurance industries where they have special disclosure and storage requirements as to this data that's being kept by our business clients. So we want to make sure we take a look at those if our client is in a regulated industry. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go over some digital asset types. We're going to start with a personal or an individual, the kind of digital assets that they may have. And you have this in your handout so it can serve as a really neat little checklist um, when you go through it with your client. And the first ones are the ones that deal financially, right? So any account that your client may have that actually stores their credit card information. And you know, there could be many more than individuals originally think about. So Amazon and Land's End, and you know with Amazon, they have um, special, uh, special technology where you say just click once and all your information, your shipping information, your billing information, your financial information, automatically gets populated into that order form. Okay, and so for many of our clients, they look at it, well, this makes it easy for us to then go and purchase things online. Um, but it also means that their data, their financial data is out there stored somewhere. And it's, it's really very easy for them to sort of lose track of how many of these online sites that they actually have their credit card information stored in. Another one may be an adult content site or airline frequent flyer mile accounts like Delta, Continental, American, many, many others, not just US, but maybe if your client does a lot of international um, flying, also the international airlines and those frequent flyer mile accounts as well. Bank and financial accounts and banking, yes, lots of people do their online banking, do their bill paying, buy online, but there are also financial accounts like stock options like we saw in that example that we had at the very beginning of this session. Okay. Don't also forget some of our hardware devices, things like our computers, our laptops, our tablets, even our cell phones. Lots of these have their own built-in passwords um, that you want to make sure that there is access to if that person is no longer available. Okay. Then there are other email accounts such as eBay or Craigslist. Even things like Angie's List or Susie's Coupons or these places where they say that they sort of help you, but you've registered with them. And so, you know, they do have some of your information. An iTunes account may have some of your financial information. Any personal email accounts, and you know, individuals may have an account for their work, may have an account for their personal, if they have a side job or a hobby, there are different places where they might have email accounts. You want to make sure that you have that information as well. Photo and video sites, so things like Vimeo and YouTube and Flickr. Uh, sometimes like Vimeo might allow you to even have a private channel and so making sure that that information is put in as well. Lifestyle specific accounts. Now these are really interesting. These include things like Ancestry.com where individuals are putting information not just about themselves but about family members, immediate family members and then family members back in history. Okay, and so sometimes things like an Ancestry.com account could be something that, you know, others in the family would really like to have access to and see what information has been found about their family. Um, but it's not necessarily known by all the family members who may have that account or who may not. Okay, uh, Food TV may be one. And now we're seeing lots more of medical and genetic information accounts that are up there. So even pharmacies, when people go and refill 
um, their prescription. Now they can do it online and that information is stored there. Uh, doctors' offices right now are becoming very technologically advanced and adding information right on devices right when you go into their office and their visits and they have all the blood work results and all of the medical information up there that's very important to keep track on online and social games so we have things that might be something as simple as words with friends that are played on a cell phone or an ipad or something that's a little bit more complex like second life or even world of warcraft where individuals become other animated characters or avatars and we know that some of these games also have microtransactions um, so they you use actual real currency to purchase things in these games and so financial information is also kept in these games including credit card information billing information of the individual and so again important to keep track of where these are there are online bill pay systems such as PayPal um, and PayPal is not only used for business scenarios but also can be used by individuals so you know there are other bank accounts that are also saying you know just email a person a certain amount of money um, you can do that through PayPal now and then it will go into their PayPal account so again financial information that you want to take a look at there are shared accounts like Google Docs where many individuals can access specific things online and be able to share or work on something together. And then of course the social media accounts like Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and voicemail accounts like Google Voice and others. And these voicemail accounts sort of become a proxy to the voicemail that's on the personal home phone or on the cell phone, but sort of um, are there to hold and receive uh, voicemail from different accounts into one specific location. So in basic, I mean, after you hear all those different accounts from the personal end, we can give a, a very basic definition that digital assets are really the combination of the many points of personal digital interaction by an individual in the online space. And I'm just going to repeat that again. Digital assets as the combination of many points of personal digital interaction by an individual in the online. Okay, so now that we looked at some personal types of digital assets, I want to go over some of the digital assets that our business clients may have. And some of these may seem, you know, pretty obvious and some of them may not but one thing that we have to keep in mind is that we have different size business clients so if our business client is actually a sole proprietor or a small business client that may have you know two three or maybe up to five employees some of the accounts might be you know overlap between the business and the personal um, corporate accounts are going to be much different, right? They're going to be quite separated just because of their size. But just keep that in mind that sometimes with our small business clients, some of these types of digital assets might actually overlap. So the first ones, of course, we begin with the bank and financial accounts. Um, every business is going to have at least one business account. Now, depending on the type of business, depending on whether it's a regulated business or even, you know, think about us as attorneys, we have various accounts because not only do we have our operating account, we might have a client trust account that we put things in escrow um, for clients when they pay us a retainer and then we move money from there. So there might be more than one account for that business. And a client account system um, you know, for us as attorneys, we might have a case management system that does billing of what we do with our particular clients. Uh, but for other um, types of businesses, there might, just might be a way to keep account of each of our clients, their information, their billing information, their, uh, you know, location, what they purchased, uh, some private notes about them, those kinds of things. We also have employee email accounts for the system. Uh, we may also have a human resource system 
uh, this can be, you know, different policies or manuals that are actually available and accessible to employees online. Sometimes it could also be a place where um, individuals can go and see what jobs are available, you know, classified for the job postings for that particular company. So there are uh, even benefit information might be in a human resource system online. So there are different things that they may have out there. A payroll system. Now some of your business clients may actually use a third party um, payroll uh, entity, something like ADP or one of those that they take care of the payroll, they issue the checks, they manage it. Um, so knowing access and the IDs and all of that information in order to get to the those types of systems are also important. Um, the company may also have a procurement or vendor account system that again includes the company's credit card and financial information um, so that purchases can be made. So you see a lot of these accounts, right, are really have some kind of financial information and even the HR account is going to have the information regarding salaries, regarding evaluations, and this is very important because we know that, for example, in HR, all of those benefits and the insurance information, there is the law of HIPAA, which protects health information. Um, and so, you know, you, the company has to be very careful about who has access to information and even things like social security numbers. Um, and, you know, parts of that may get uh, caught up in things like e-verify with the federal government in terms of immigration status. So, you know, all of those things are wrapped up in those accounts that are all online, that are all right now a digital asset of your client and your company, okay? Now, there are also business social media accounts. So, you know, social media accounts that might not just be run by an individual employee as their personal account, but maybe a business account that's run by an employee who's hired by the company to do that Twitter or that Facebook or fan page or that LinkedIn account for the benefit of the company. And you know, one of the issues that are coming up is that then who owns it? And we have a, a case um, in the UK that talks about LinkedIn followers, okay, contacts. And the case goes on to say that an employee who went to the competition must give back to their old employer their LinkedIn contacts because that is considered proprietary information or trade secrets. So the same thing as if you were to relinquish your Rolodex. Well, the LinkedIn was looked at as the electronic online equivalent of that Rolodex and so belonged to the employer. We have a US case going on right now that talks about Twitter followers, where we had an employee who called his account, let's say his name is John, his company's name was ABC, so he had an account called John ABC, and then he decided that he was going to take into position at the competitor who happened to be XYZ. And with Twitter, you can actually very easily change the account name. So he went from John ABC to John XYZ and basically just took the 17,000 followers that he had from one and just continued it with the other. Okay, and so the, the former employer is suing, again stating this is trade secrets, stating that those followers, because the account had the company's name, that those followers belong to the company. So we're going to see where, um, where that case goes. It hasn't been decided yet. Uh, but most people, when you talk about that case, will give the opinion that if it had the company's name on the account, that then it is property of the company. So, you know, it's something that you can do with your own clients and auditing uh, the names of the different social media accounts that they're actually using um, to do their social media activity, okay? One of the things that we're discovering, and it's in the process again, because social media is relatively new, um, even though you might say, well, there it's been around since 2007, 2008, and that sort of thing, but really coming on its own uh, in today's world is, you know, there's a difference between the account and the content of the account, 
right? What actually gets posted or what actually gets tweeted, those are two different things. So if the name of the company is on um, the account, but the content of what goes out in the account is very personal, well, we might have some questions there, right, of, of the actual structure and purpose of that particular account. Um, the other thing is, how do you measure the value of these digital assets? How do you measure how much a follower is worth? And you know, in the very beginning of social media, it was really focused on numbers. I want to get, you know, tens of thousands of Twitter followers. And on Facebook, I want to have a million fans and YouTube. I want my video to go viral and have a million. And we're seeing some change in the industry that says now, you know, having the numbers is fine. But what's really important is the influence you have on those followers or fans. In other words, if you put out a call to action, okay, how many of those followers or fans are actually going to answer that call? How many of them are going to purchase your service or your product or get in touch with you or, you know, donate to a cause that you have put out? So we're seeing a shift from just numbers to actual influence the results that you can get because of the numbers you have okay and will that in any way in the future then affect the value for example of an m a a merger and acquisition between two companies you know will mean that one company is worth more because they have more twitter followers than the other ones um, again that's brand new territory don't know how the sec is going to look at it but it's something to just keep in the back of our minds that it is going to be coming up in terms of valuation for our business clients, you know. And so now that we've looked at these different types of assets, both from the personal individual client view and the business view, and again, this is not an all-inclusive list. There are many, many other assets that may be out there and may be very specific to your client, but this should at least be a starting point um, and trigger some things in your client to think of any other accounts that may not be on that list, okay? Well, it's one thing to know that these are the type of accounts, but it's the other thing to then say, okay, so what are we gonna do with it next? And that's the idea behind a digital legacy plan, okay? It's that we can, we know what assets we have and then we know what we want done with them should you know, an employee be terminated with the company or if our individual client dies, okay? And so what we wanna do is, and again, some of you may actually be in the legal practice area of wills and estate planning. Some of you may not. If you're not, you definitely just wanna make your client aware of this issue so that then they can do what they need to do to protect their assets should something happen to them. Okay, so it's important to educate our clients on how to organize their digital accounts and to prepare what they want done with these items when they pass, okay? That's the idea of the digital legacy plan. And why? Why is that important? Well, because if we don't prepare for it, it's just like if your client dies without a will and he has a lot of assets, it'll then go into probate court, right? It'll then, uh, you know, the state will determine who receives what. And if your client did not want a particular person to receive something, or if your client wanted a particular person or a charity to receive something, where, well, their interest and in, in what they want is not going to be followed because they didn't have that document, right? They did not have the will. And so if we don't also prepare for these digital possessions, they can become lost, they can become closed down, they can be deleted, they can be removed, they can even be stolen. So if you think of clients that may be artists or authors who have written things out there, somebody can actually then, um, you know, just basically take that information and claim that it was theirs. Uh, not that we would want them to, but it does happen. And so we know that, you know, what digital assets in a way different from many of our other assets and positions, they really chronicle the life history, identity, and wealth of our clients, whether that's a personal client or a business client. So there is a lot of value, sentimental, emotional, and financial that we want to help our clients protect, okay? So we're gonna go through some basic steps 
that your client can do with your assistance um, to help them on this road of protecting their digital assets and creating their digital legacy. Okay, so as I said, we're going to now look at some steps. So the first step is to have your client make a list, okay? Inventory the digital devices, the online accounts, the different uh, online subscriptions, all of those things, have them write it down. And this is a quite an exercise for some of our clients because they won't realize just how many accounts they have. Now, when they write down this inventory, there are certain pieces of information that they should make sure to also include. So, number one, the name of the account, okay? The site, if, it's, if there's an email address or the company name of where that account actually is. The access codes, and those are our credentials, an ID and a password. Also, something that many people usually don't write down is that lots of these, these accounts actually have what are known as security questions, like what is the maiden name of your mother? What was the first the name of your first high school? Things of those nature. And so lots of times individuals will forget to write them down because they figured, well, they know that, right? Um, but when, they, when your client's taking this inventory, it's important for them to include that information too because somebody else might not know it and may need access to that. And then the other thing that they need to write down if, if there's any expiration or renewal dates for any of these accounts. So for example, a domain name um, usually has to be renewed every, annually or maybe if, if you've got it for two or three years, every two or three years. And so it's really important that, you know, when they make this inventory that they know when they have to renew it because if not, they're going to then lose access to that. And if it's in the business world and it's their, you know, their website for their business, they definitely do not want to miss a renewal date. Now that may be taken care of by their IT department, um, but for now, it's important to put it on the inventory and make sure that that information is there. And you know, sometimes just going through the process of creating the inventory can open your client's eyes to some risk or liability in terms of security of their accounts because they might not realize, for example, that the passwords that they have been using are probably not the best or that all their accounts have the same password, which is really not secure. Um, so you might also just wanna give uh, some basic tips to your client about what makes a good password when they're securing their online accounts. Because as we saw, so many of these accounts and digital assets are actually financial information or personal information in nature. Okay. So they make that list, they inventory, they've spent, you know, probably weeks and months trying to figure out every little last one that they've had. The next thing is to review the list and then make a note next to each one what should be done with that account or that asset um, if they should pass, you know? And they might say, well, I want this account deleted or uh, give the password to my spouse or, or to someone else. Or they might say, well, convert to a memorial page. And we're gonna see that in a little bit with Facebook. Or they might want something else done to it. So if it's a famous author or artist, they might want their content donated to a museum, for example, or a book society, okay? So it's, it's really important, look at the list and then decide what you want to do with it. Um, once they do that preliminary review, then have them review the list a second time with you or someone that can also go through the terms of service of these online accounts. Now in this handout, I have quite a few resources for you and we'll go over them in a minute, okay? But you need to know whether these accounts allow you to transfer access to them or not. So we saw that case in the very beginning with the Marine and that the Yahoo email would not allow that transfer and the father had to go to court. And in the end, he did not receive access to the account. What he received were copies of the content, okay, which is very, very different. Um, and also, 
each of these online accounts will usually state what it is that the individual needs to do to close the account or to change the account like into a memorial page or if they do allow it to transfer the account so you know some uh, of these online accounts may say well we need to see a death certificate others may say we need to see the obituary um, there are different things that they might require so let's go through an example right now this deals with frequent flyer miles and we're going to use Delta's terms of service okay and if you go to the Delta Sky Miles um, page what you'll see is that they say they reserve the right to deactivate or close an account under the following circumstances and these are the circumstances they list they say number one if fraudulent activity occurs then they can close the account if a member requests that the account is closed they can close the account if a member is deceased so as soon as they know that a member is deceased they'll close the account okay a member does not respond to repeated communication attempts regarding the status of his or her account and that last one is interesting because it it does connect to the one above it and saying that maybe a member is deceased and this is the idea that you know different account systems may send an email every once in a while to see if there's a response to see if that member is even alive um, and some of us may think well I'm just gonna delete it I'm not even gonna bother to respond but by not responding it may actually set off a trigger with these accounts that if they haven't heard from you in a certain amount of time they'll close it down and they'll put in that the member is deceased and one of the things we know is that it is very difficult and time consuming to actually prove that you are indeed alive once one of these accounts has decreed that you are deceased okay another thing that the Delta Sky Miles says is that membership numbers are non transferable Transferable, and only one person may be enrolled per Sky Miles account and so you have there in the handout um, the link to where I got these okay and so these are important we had um, a case where a father had about I would say over a hundred thousand uh, frequent flyer miles uh, was deceased you know Delta wanted to close down the account um, the son argued well you know some of these miles belong to my mother because she traveled with him and so in reality you should give them to your to the mother and now they do have a joint account between the mother and the son to make sure that they don't lose the miles but you know that was before Delta said you cannot have joint accounts now so that's changed now one of the things that you can let your client know though is that Delta and many other frequent flyer mile accounts do allow transfer of the miles while the member is alive so one of the things if your client has you know an extraordinary amount of miles they can actually donate those miles to a charity and get a flight uh, to donate to charity or they might want to give it as gifts during Christmas um, or other holidays but they need to do that while they are alive okay it's much easier you can't do it in the will you can't do it in your digital you know testimony you have to do it while you're alive inter vivos okay um the next thing that i have in the handout is sort of i've highlighted the site of where you can go for facebook to convert a personal account to a memorial account and, and we know that you know after um, a certain tragedy there were requests to Facebook and how they can make a friend's personal account into a memorial account and basically what that does is that it's it means that you know the account becomes closed people can't post status on the account but people can put and write things of what they felt about that individual on their wall or sharing stories with that individual so you see here on the handout it is a form that you fill out and they ask things like you know the full name of the person when they died 
um, and proof of death. So they do require either a death certificate or obituary and that gets scanned and then sent to them. And that's all done online in Facebook, okay? We also have Twitter. Now remember, one of the things to keep in mind is that Twitter has already stated that it has donated all of its tweets, all of them, to the Library of Congress to be preserved. Okay, so there really is no ownership of a Twitter tweet because it's been donated to the Library of Congress. But if you require copies of the account or, or to close the account, here again you will see that there is, is the um, link of where you need to go. But also understand that Twitter requires the documents to be faxed or mailed. They don't accept it just online. On Facebook you can send it online, but on Twitter you can't. And so here you see how to contact Twitter about a deceased user, okay? And it lays out all the information that you have to send them, but you do have to fax or mail it to them. So you have there the link of where to go. Now, of course, you know, Facebook and Twitter are just two of the many online accounts that our clients may have. And there's this wonderful resource, it's called Deceased Accounts, okay, and you have the link here, www.deceasedaccounts.com. And it's an online resource of documentation and best practices from online account providers on how to close, transfer, or change accounts of deceased users. Now, this is not a comprehensive, 100% complete resource. It does not list every single online account out there, but it is pretty, um, uh, it does have quite a bit of them and it serves as a great starting point. So if you become a digital executor to, to one of your clients or, or a family member or that sort of thing, it is a great place to start um, and even when you review that list of assets with your clients, it's a great place to go and cross-reference the accounts that your client lists and this deceased accounts to make sure that both of you understand um, the different nuances for them. And so here again in your handout, you have a little screenshot of what that looks like that is constantly being updated. If you are working on an account that's not on that list, I, I highly recommend that you then send to deceased accounts what you found out so that others can benefit um, from what you've discovered. But it is a great resource and starting step um, to where you wanna go from there, okay? And you know, I did mention this idea of a digital executor, and this is also very controversial. Um, they say, well, if you have an executor for your will, why can't it also, why can't they also deal with the digital assets that you have? And, and one of the things that has been coming up is, well, will a, can a regular will executor understand the technology enough to be able to disperse the digital assets. Um, so it's something to keep in mind uh, with your client because it has to be somebody that they trust, somebody who knows enough of technology, not that they have to know all the ins and outs, not that they have to be a programmer, but enough of technology to understand what these are and how they, they work. And also someone who doesn't mind doing those steps that need to be done, the extra work that needs to be done to get these digital assets in order. And it's very important, just like with a will, that your client speaks to whoever they decide is going to be the executor, they should speak with who they decide is going to be the digital executor so that that person is not taken completely by surprise and then just says, no, I'm not gonna deal with that. I don't wanna deal with that. Um, because there may be things online that they did not know of the individual and now they're, they have to face it and they might not want to discover those aspects of their deceased friend or family member. Um, so it can be quite emotional uh, a thing to do. So again, speaking with the client and making sure that if they select that individual, that that individual has been spoken to 
about this responsibility because it is a big responsibility. Okay, so after that, reviewing the plan again with your client, and I know I've put that in like three times to review the plan, but it's always so important um, so that everybody really knows what your client wants, whether it's a business client or an individual client and what to do moving forward, okay? Things to keep in mind as well is that digital property, just like tangible property, may be subject to certain state laws of accession and distribution. So some things may not just be able to be inherited or passed on. Um, they may lose their value at the moment of death. So it's important to take a look at that. Now we do have some states that have started putting in legislation that deals specifically with online accounts of the deceased. We don't have very many. There's Oklahoma, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Idaho right now. And I have a link there that shows you their particular statues. Um, but again, that's just four, right? But this is an area that we're gonna see grow and we're gonna see more and more states have this legislation or modify the legislation that they have to include online and social media accounts because of the way that people's lives are changing, the way that we're conducting our lives much more online. So, so this is gonna be an area that's continuously gonna be updated. Look in your own jurisdiction, in your own state. You know, if you see that your state now has legislation that's doing this, please let us know here um, so that we can update this as well for those who are listening. So again, an area that is in constant change, okay? Now here comes a tricky part. So you have the plan, your client and you have reviewed it, you know what you want done with it, what do you do with the plan, okay? And you know, there are different ways. You can go a high-tech way and you can go a low-tech way with putting the plan away in a safe place. Um, it's interesting, some people might just do what they do with their regular will, right? Put it into a, uh, a deposit box at the bank or put it in, in a safe storage box that they might have at home or even leave it in the lawyer's office um, for security. Uh, and then there are some online sites, things like Entrustnet, Legacy Lockers, and others of those where you can keep that list online, that plan online. And you actually have here, I put into the handout a, uh, a link to what's called online services list. And this is it from the Digital Beyond website. And this is just a list of all these different websites that offer services to hold um, your plans for your digital legacy and digital afterlife. So you can even just take a look at that list and go through it and see, you know, what these different services are, what they offer. Um, and I do put a caution, you know, it's always difficult to get a client to write their will. Um, it is an emotional thing to think about their ultimate, you know, death. Um, and they don't necessarily want to dwell on it. And I think that's one of the reasons why so few Americans actually write a will, because it's not something that they want to think about, that they want to talk about. Um, and you know, some of these services, like we saw with the Delta, where they send an email every once in a while um, to see if they get a response. But some of these services actually send emails to see if you're alive, you know, if you're alive, respond to this. Um, and a lot of our clients, they don't wanna receive an email every few months that says, if you're alive, respond to this. They don't wanna think about their death in that way. Um, and then it becomes, you know, a very tedious process and that sort of thing. Uh, so if your client decides that they want to use one of these online digital lockers, for example, it's something that they need to understand how that service is actually going to work, okay? One thing that you should not do is do not put the list in the will itself. You can reference the list in the will, but don't put the contents of that list and plan in the will. And the reason for that is that once the person dies, the will becomes a public document and it's accessible by anybody in the public and you don't want a stranger to then have access to passwords and other sensitive information that had been put 
in that plan, okay? So you wanna make sure nothing, any of that sensitive information is not in the will, okay? The other thing to go over with your client is that, you know, we change passwords and accounts all the time. And so they have to keep this list and plan up to date with new accounts, if accounts have been terminated or disabled, if there's been a change in the password or a change in the security questions. Um, so your client wants to do an update, you know, maybe every three months. If they're older in age, you might want to make sure they do an update every month or every time they change something. And that may seem a little tedious, but it is very important because having a list without dated information, that it's the same as not having a list at all because you're not going to have access, okay? And your client is not going to be able to get to do what they need to do with this. So again, very important that you emphasize with your client how important it is to keep that inventory up to date, okay? Again, I'm gonna remind you to talk with your client about talking to the person who whoever needs to know about this digital part of what they're leaving behind in their legacy. They may need to talk to their spouse or their children or their significant others. And the idea of significant others also brings up a very important point. Keep in mind that same-sex marriages and civil unions may also affect this. And depending on the jurisdiction and the law in your state, you know, in regards to disbursement of assets in same-sex couples, some of the things that they want to do, they may not be able to do by law. And so it is a discussion that you do have to have with your client to make sure that you are, in fact, um, within the laws as you disperse these assets. Now, there is a great book, not from the legal angle, but just from the digital assets angle. It's called Your Digital Afterlife. It's by Erin, I'm sorry, Even Carroll and John Romano. The website is www.yourdigitalafterlife.com. And it is a wonderful book that goes over and actually offers some simple forms for doing uh, the digital asset legacy inventory that's there. So it's good to go over it. And now I want to go over a few things as it relates specifically to our business clients, okay? Because when the business client also is going to do this inventory, one of the things that they have to keep in mind are some of their other policies and procedures things that deal with, for example, information technology, intellectual property, social media, or other digital media policies that they might have in place already to make sure that what needs to be done is also in compliance with the policies that they have there, okay? Um, you need to find out, do they lay out these procedures anywhere? So if, for example, you know, again, looking at a small business entity, if the small business entity is run by you know one president and then what happens if that president is no longer there or if one of the managing partners is no longer there do people have access to those accounts so it's very important um, that the company sort of thinks about this and puts this in procedure or even if an employee is terminated or dismissed or resigned you know, to make sure that they don't have access to information that they shouldn't have access to if they're no longer associated with the company. So the changing of passwords, for example, or security questions once that employee leaves can actually affect access to the digital assets of the company. So very important to keep that in mind, okay? You need to know if issues such as these are being addressed by the employment agreements that the company is signing with their employees so that employees understand, you know, the work for hire doctrine, that anything that they create really belongs to the company, accounts that they work on for the company belong to the company, and that once they leave, all access to that information is considered trade secret and proprietary information and must then um, be given back to the company. And so, you want to make sure that that's in their agreements. You want to make sure, you know, are employees, and this includes managers and staff, are they being trained 
in regards to this issue so they know what they can and cannot do and uh, what happens once they leave if, if it's part of a non-compete clause for example or an exclusivity clause um, it's very important to make that you know very clear with your employees and I'm going to end with two additional resources that are great readings and I think really go even more into depth about um, this issue. The first one is a New York Times January 2011 article called Cyberspace When You're Dead and you have the link there or you can just Google the title for it. The second one is from Forbes magazine in April 2011 called Digital Death and Digital Afterlife Serious Business. Okay and so these are two great articles um, the New York Times one is a little bit longer than the Forbes one, but they're great. You can share it with your clients, both business and personal clients. Um, there's also a blog about digital assets through Law2SM and our blog site. So there, there are lots of resources that are coming out now for you to do what you need to do to help your clients be prepared about their digital assets online, social media, and beyond in those. So as always, if you have questions, please send us an email. You can send it to Deborah at law2sm.com. And just have a great day and see you in our next session. Bye.